From Microbe TV, this is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode 194, recorded on April 22nd, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent, and everybody else. Uh, looking out my window, I see puffy white clouds, sort of a Georgia O'Keeffe ish look, but it's not Georgia O'Keeffe ish in terms of temperature because she lived in the desert in the warm part of the world. We are now uh, something like 48 degrees or 50 degrees, something in that neighborhood, but uh, that's Fahrenheit. Uh, windy. Uh, a very blustery April day, which, you know, that's put the spring for you. Also joining us from New York, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. Hey, Daniel, <laughs> you think the wind I don't is, do the weather. The wind. <laughs> you know, the, the Come on, only, what kind of sailor are you? <laughs> I was going to say, would you like to go exactly. sailing in this wind? Of course you would. So, yeah, that's the only thing I ever, the only time I ever look at the weather is if I am able to potentially go sailing. And then I will be able to tell you exactly where the wind is and, and <laughs> what, what I expect it to be as far as uh, strength. Um, but otherwise, I just walk out in a blur. Suddenly I get rained on. Um, I'm not aware, <laughs> so. <laughs> also joining us today from Glasgow, Scotland, Christina Naula. Welcome back. Thank you very much. And hello, everybody. I'm um, looking Christina. outside my window. It's black. But yeah. earlier on, the, <laughs> the, weather, <laughs> the weather was gorgeous with blue skies and um, not terribly warm, but not cold either. So Did you step nice. outside today at all, Christina? Yes, yes. I went um, I went for a run, actually, earlier this evening. Oh, very good. Um, a, a pathetic run, but I did go out. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well. First up, we do our clinical case, and uh, Daniel, do. remind us what we have here. All right. As I like to say, to remind everyone who are who is tuning back in and to, uh, to tell everyone uh, who is tuning in for the first time, um, we presented on um, the last TWIP the case of a male in his 50s um, who was initially seen for unilateral eye pain, blurred vision, watery drainage. Um, we learned that this was a soft contact lens wearer. Um, he was initially given some eye drops, oral medication, sent for another opinion when this didn't actually resolve. Um, we can learn a little bit more about him. He has high blood pressure, high cholesterol, um, but otherwise pretty healthy. No surgeries, no allergies. Um, he works in a store, no toxic substances. He was HIV negative as a... Uh, we were able to learn from, uh, I think, Vincent's pointed questions. Um, we also learned that he lives on a large piece of land with his own well. Um, so he has his own well water. He lives away from the city, has his own septic tank. Um, and his left eye was very red. The ophthalmologist reported that there was decreased visual acuity in the left eye when he goes to the, to the ophthalmologist. He had injection of the conjunctiva. It was edema. There were erosions visualized. Um, corneal scrapings were sent for culture. Um, we also got that he swims in the Long Island Sound, but has no other travel or exposure history, no pets. All right, here we go. Dixon, can you take that first one? You bet. Anthony writes, likely an amoebic infection of the eye caused by either acanthamoeba or valcamphia, since these amoebae are oddly able to live in salt water. Hmm. Hmm. Daniel, can you take the next one? Alan writes, greetings, TWIP friends. Weather here in Kona is ADF 27C, 70% humidity and partly cloudy. What about the wind? Um, I believe this patient uh, is most likely suffering from acanthamoeba keratitis caused by the protozoan acanthamoeba castellani. 
While there are many microbes that can infect the eye and cause the described signs and symptoms, the primary one associated with untreated water and contact lens use is Acanthamoeba castellani. While identification through PCR is possible, definitive diagnosis usually still depends on seeing the amoeba in tears or scraping, such as with a rapid field stain. Treatment has historically been difficult, and rather than describing old methods, I look forward to hearing more promising approaches from <laughs> Daniel et al. Thank you for your wonderful podcasts. Hmm. Uh, Christina. James writes, hello, Twippers. I am a big fan of all this week in podcasts, but have never sent in a case guess, but decided to do so for the parasitic eye infection presented in episode 193. I am a commercial lender with no formal medical training, but I know you'll be kind. <laughs> the patient <laughs> presented with irritation and edema of the left eye, accompanied by decreased visual acuity and erosions of the cornea. Of note, the patient is a soft contact lens wearer and lives on a rural property with its own well and septic tank. My guess is that the gentleman has a case of acanthamoeba keratitis caused by the protozoa acanthamoeba, which is a very common organism found in soil and freshwater environments worldwide. Acanthamoeba is transmitted through direct contact between the parasite and the cornea of the eye. And poor contact lens care is a major risk factor for developing acanthamoebiasis. I believe the most likely source of infection is contaminated well water being used to clean and store the patient's contact lenses. In 2016, Jennifer R. Cope, MD et al., published a case control investigation of two multi-state AK outbreaks among rigid rigid contact lens wearers and found that even using tap water to store um, RGP lenses and to top off solution in the lens case were risky behaviors. My research also uncovered a 2006 case published in the Canadian Journal of Infectious Diseases and Medical Microbiology of AK in a healthy 14-year-old soft lens wearer, where an epidemiological link was established between the patient's isolate and well water from the home using molecular methods. That paper also cites two other cases of AK caused by contaminated well water. Thanks for keeping me entertained and educated. Caroline writes... For this case, I think the patient was infected with an acanthamoeba causing an acanthamoeba keratitis. I found this article that lists a good number of known fungal and parasitic eye diseases. Very helpful and provides a link. Acanthamoeba can be found in improperly treated water supplies and contact lens solution, either of which could have been the origin of the disease in this case since he doesn't treat his well water and he uses contact lenses. Its symptoms include eye pain, decreased vision, redness, and discharge, which the patient had. The corneal scrapings can be used to view trophozoites and cysts in stained preparations to confirm the diagnosis. Treatment is difficult. Different med medicinal regimens exist involving antifungals, antibiotics, etc. However, apparently these often don't work and the patient may need surgical intervention. Even with surgery, if cysts are, are still present, the patient may continue to suffer from recurrent infections. Thanks again and stay safe. Dixon. Laura writes, warm spring greetings to everybody at TWIP. I really liked ophthalmology when I was in medical school, but more on a theoretical level. And I was pretty good at diagnosing photographs. However, when watching actual examinations or procedures, my eyes would tear up so bad I couldn't actually see much. My diagnosis for this case is amoebic keratitis caused by acanthamoeba species. The organisms have no vector. They live in bodies of water and soil where they feed on bacteria and debris, but have also been found in tap water and air conditioners. They have to come in direct contact with micro abrasions on the cornea to be able to infect it. These protozoa cause a subacute or chronic keratitis inflammation of the cornea associated with contact lenses in 80% of the cases or corneal trauma. It is interesting that some bacteria, fungi, and other protozoans can survive inside a canthamoeba in a possibly symbiotic relationship, increasing pathogenicity and complicating or hindering treatment. 
The keratitis presents days after infection with pain, photophobia, tearing, dendritic ulcers, and a characteristic ring infiltrate. And she submits a picture with all of those characteristics, and it's quite graphic. And I'm starting to tear up right now just looking at it, thinking what it would be like to have it myself. The differential diagnosis would include viral, most often herpetic, bacterial and fungal keratitis. The definitive diagnosis is established by a corneal scraping or biopsy with wet mounts, culture, histopathology, or PCR, or more recently, in vivo, confocal microscopy. The contact lenses and contact lenses solution can also be cultured. Treatment options are topical chlorhexidine, polyhexamethylene biguanide, or voriconazole, voriconazole to which oral therapy can be added with azoles or meltifacine. Medical treatment is 80 to 90% effective and surgery is sometimes required. Prevention, preventative measures include changing the cleaning solution every night, <clears throat> only using commercial solutions and not homemade, although cases tied to some commercial solutions have also occurred. Letting the contact lenses air dry uh, thoroughly each day and changing it frequently. Contact lens wearers should never go swimming or showering with their contacts on. Thank you for this interesting case. Patiently waiting for the next episode, Laura. Daniel. Byron. Byron writes, distinguished <laughs> with hosts. Have to say, this is a very interesting case. My guess was giardiasis. Although it is commonly known for GI symptoms, I do find some cases of ocular involvement we get a link there. Thanks for all the work and all the intriguing cases. My background is not related to uh, medical, but found this immensely intriguing. Thank you. Christina. Alexander writes, dear professors, the differential for a middle-aged man, man with unilateral keratitis is quite broad. Aside from non-infectious etiologies, such as direct trauma, like ophthalmus, often as a consequence of facial nerve palsy or foreign bodies stuck under the eyelid, may dif many different pathogens should be considered. Since viral conjunctivitis is typ typically bilateral and fungal keratitis rarely occurs in immune competent individuals, bacteria and protozoans should be at the top of the list. A notable exception is herpes simplex keratitis, which can also be considered here and can usually be identified by the classically dendritic appearance of the corneal ulcers. The most common bacteria that cause keratitis in healthy subjects are Staph aureus and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. In patients using contact lenses, Pseudomonas can cause corneal ulcers that require immediate therapy with IV and topical antibiotics. Rarer causes include leptospirosis, melioidosis, and trachoma, which don't really fit the history here. The classical protozoan to colonize contact lenses if improper cleaning solutions are used is Acanthamoeba species. Others are T. gondii or Giardia, which are less typical. I believe this gentleman is in for a long course of topical combination therapy to kill off all his acanthamoebic friends and complementary bottle of sterile contact lens cleaning solution, or even simpler, a pair of glasses. Thank you for the interesting case. Take care. Alexander from Vienna in Austria. Hmm. Daniel, is that true that uh, viral hemorrhagic infections are bilateral typically? Yeah, they. And that's, that's sort of some of the interesting features that were brought up here. Um, often with your bacterial, you'll end up with just one. A lot of times with your viral, you can end up with bilateral. Um, the leptospirosis, I've seen several cases of that. It's one of my favorites. Um, and there was actually a really nice study out of uh, Puerto Rico where you could really see like if you look, almost everyone has sort of red swollen eyes. Mm. All right, Andrew writes, Kia Ora from Pongaroa. Weather, the La Nina has ended and we are returning to normal. Yay. COVID, the New Zealander of the year has been voted for and it is a microbiologist named Susie Wiles. I know Susie. She was and still is the most prominent science communicator engaged in educating the public on SARS-CoV-2 and the pandemic in general. Here in the U.S., we don't give prizes to science communicators. Good for you. 
<laughs> Book, not one yet, but did Daniel mention version eight? I don't know. I don't think I think he did, yeah. My guess for the man I'm with uni unilateral eye pain is acanthamoeba keratitis caused by water contaminated with the microbes being used to clean his contact lenses. PD7 notes that the increase in contact lens use is leading to more cases. And now that they're being used for purely cosmetic reasons, I suppose that we will see even more cases in the future unless education in lens hygiene is also increased. Nah, Andrew. Dixon. Martha writes, dear Twipsters, I will try to be brief since I'm sure you will have many responses to this case. I do want to express my enjoyment for all the twee podcasts. I plan my walks based on the program's length. For Dr. Griffin's updates, I do a short loop and a brisk pace, while for the twice weekly twivs, I can do a long leisurely stroll. Twip falls in the middle. I uh, try to plan the end walk so I can jot down the case notes. Thank you for all you do. And it's, it's, and it's eyeball parasites again. Interestingly, I happened to stumble upon this parasite. I was looking at images of infected eyes, trying to find something that would be small enough to fit in the anterior chamber of the eye, but large enough to block the pupil. Acanthamoeba keratitis was not a suspect in that case, but swam to the top of the list this time. Giardia always comes to mind when well water is mentioned, and they can infect the eye. However, they cause a, a retinal problem. I'm sticking with the amoeba since all the clues point in that direction. Soft contact lens use, eye pain and visual changes, corneal scrapings for diagnosis. Using that pure well water to wash the lenses was perhaps the source. All the best to you all, Martha. Daniel. All right, Erica writes, Hi, Twip. Greetings from Toronto, where it's 10C and cloudy. We are currently under a stay-at-home order in our third wave of the pandemic, so I can't thank you enough for the company of your friendly voices. It's thanks to this podcast and Twiv for rekindling my interest in science. I'm now walking, working toward going back to school for pharmacy after dropping out of engineering school eight years ago. I always look forward to a new case study. So here goes my guess for the most recent one, acanthamoeba keratitis. Still hoping for a book, Erica. Christina. Katie Jane writes, Dear all, I remember listening to one of the earliest episodes of TWIP a few years ago where Dixon stated that you should never store your contact lens in water. And I have never done it <laughs> since I spelt as an I for the listeners. This case reminded me of that episode and Daniel's avoidance of the question as to whether or not the patient was washing his contact lenses in well water supports my line of thought. So my guess is acanthamoeba castellani causing acanthamoeba keratitis. 38 degrees Fahrenheit and windy in north central Wisconsin, but the avian spring visitors are trickling in. Thanks for all that you do, Katie Jane. Caton writes, hello, fellow Twippers and Twippies. In the case of the aching eyeball, that's a good one. The case of the aching eyeball. Could it be the <laughs> rare visioning, vision threatening condition of acanthamoeba keratitis? I checked my work with Twip39 and I insist. Uh, I E N C Y S T. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> this is the Gross. correct answer. <laughs> Well, I am not a doctor. I am just a lady farmer. Wow. Caton, I didn't know. See, I can't tell from Caton what you are. I assume that all the juicy details of this nasty eye condition will have been thoroughly discussed by everyone already. However, I have to say that the thing that strikes me about this particular organism is its rarity, or rather, its rarity in causing disease. Acanthamoeba is actually quite common, and most everyone has been exposed to it. But for the immune compromise, there's a reason for further concern. Acanthamoeba can also cause disseminated infection by entering the skin through a cut wound or through the nostrils. Once inside the body, the amoebas travel through the bloodstream to other parts of the body, especially the lungs, brain, and spinal cord, causing the deadly granulomatous amoebic encephal encephalitis. It's interesting to note that according to the CDC, there have been no documented cases of acanthamoeba spreading from the eye to other parts of the body. While I enjoy participating in TWIP case studies, I have not coveted the winning prize. However, while listening 
to TWIP 39, I have come to realize that I want that book. So please, please, pretty please pick my number. <laughs> <laughs> and Caton is from a, uh, a beef farm in Iron River, Missouri. Wow. Cool. Grass-fed beef, beef. There you go. Um, Dixon. Owain writes, Dear Twip, I hope I'm not too late this month. Somehow, I always think I have plenty of time to submit a guest, but that often leads me to leave it to the last minute. A terrible habit. My guest for this case is acanthamoeba keratitis. He probably got it either from swimming with his contacts in or the water from the well getting into his contacts somehow. The horrible sounding corneal scraping diagnostic procedure always makes me shudder. Me too. Keep the podcasts coming. All the best, Owen. So I just pasted Owen's guess in. I just was checking as we began a recording, and Owen, you just got it in time thanks to my it. vigilance. <laughs> and that'll do it wow. for our guesses. Uh, an unusually low number, but that's fine. Because we know everyone like is out missing, and about and playing somebody. now that COVID is over, right? <laughs> well, wait, he, I know what Daniel's going to say now. He he wants another opinion. <laughs> we're, well, we're miss we're missing one, right? Isn't there someone who always writes? There's several people that write and write, and they've just Kevin. Forgotten. Kevin usually writes. No, Kevin. Yeah, yeah. What happened to Kevin? Come on, Kevin. Let's get on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh well. Yeah, where where are where are the uh, you know maybe everybody is so excited by TWIV that we've lost all our listeners to TWIV. What do you think, Christina? I don't think so. um, it, depends on, <laughs> it depends on where they're from, I suppose. If they're from the UK, we've got some newfound freedoms. Um, true. With, you know, lockdown easing up a bit in England a couple of yeah, weeks that's ago. Yeah, that's true. That um, is true. For us in Scotland last week. So, you know, maybe people just want to get out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and wouldn't they be listening to Twip when they got out? I would think. <laughs> well, I do. <laughs> I have Twip on my years today on my pathetic run, so you know. Well, that's why I always get upset when my um, when when my updates don't get dropped early enough on Saturday because I wait to go out for a run. But fortunately, I hurt my knee a little while back, so. Uh, eh. you know. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> well, sorry. I just. Um, all right. Well, do we? Go ahead. <laughs> How about us? Well, do we have any guesses? Dixon, what did you think? Who who I I follow the leader here. I don't think it's Giardia. I think it's a Cantamoeba too. So that's okay. simple. But, but at least if it represents that if the picture is representative of the disease, then that's a very good um uh image to use as our show show notes, by the way. If it turns out to be that, of course. But you, Christina. Christina. Preempt. <laughs> Christina, should we let you jump in? Yeah, so I have to say, when I was listening to this twip, um, after I heard red eyes and, and painful eyes and contact lenses, that's when I stopped listening because I just thought it had <laughs> yeah, it has to be Akant Amoeba. And the reason why I'm saying that is um, I remember watching, I don't know, a few years back, there was this series on... I don't know even what TV channel it was, but it was it, it, it was some horrible parasitic diseases, and acanthamoeba uh, was one of them. Uh, I know that, uh, just, that I was the science ad, uh, advisor for that show, Monsters Inside Me. It. Yes, Monsters. I was the science me. advisor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. So that that really stuck with me. Um, so yeah, nasty, with nasty stuff. as well. Yeah, I, I think acanthamoeba yeah, is right. it. Yeah, that's and Daniel also said it's the first time for this organism, right? Mm. Yeah, I, I tried I to throw the hints out there. Um, yeah, because this. So, uh, so that was what the um, that was what the culture came back as that this was um, acanthamoeba, um, and uh, I think we had, we had done this case right after um, Audi Lear was on, and actually this this mm. gentleman lived up in Connecticut, and that was sort of the story, um, mm. and um, had had come for treatment after uh, initially being sort of you know told take some eye drops you'll get better and not getting better, right, um, and so. Uh, yeah. So there, there were a couple of features and I think our people emailing um, brought up some of the features. Um, the, these amoeba tend to live in your well water. Um, so people who are municipal water sources that are being treated um, tend to be at lower risk for this. Um, you know, I wonder about New York City, for instance, right? Because that's not actually treated water. 
Um, it's, you know, it's coming from these um, watersheds upstate New York. Um, but in this case, it was well water. Dixon, do you have any thoughts on that? I do. I, I, I remember hearing some cases that were actually traced back to that. And also in cooling towers, uh, you know, for air conditioning. So, um, and it's a heat resistant organism, the cyst, at least it is. So the Legionella organisms get inside the cyst and uh, that's the way they gain entrance to the uh, inner environment of hospitals and uh, other large institutions. So it, it's had its day in the sun, so to speak. And uh, I think because they knew that Bausch and Lomb solution was sterile, Bausch and Lomb really pushed on this issue of uh, you've got to use commercial sources of uh, lens cleaner. And of course, they were charging an arm and a leg. It prevents a cantamoeba. <laughs> <You know? laughs> well, you could do that yeah. basically boiling salt water and then using that from now on because, well, that's. Yeah, that's that's my thought. So, but I think it could come from drinking water from New York because you're right; it's not filtered. Yeah, yeah. And actually, I, I love that you bring that up. I, I know we're on TWIP and not TWIM, um, but yeah, that's often the connection with our Legionella cases that we see um, as we get into spring and we see in sort of the early fall when everyone has decided right. to stop cleaning the air conditioners because, well, it's exactly. going to all be over soon. Um, and I was asked, I was asked the medical students, like, well, what is Legionella doing in the water? It's in the water because it's an intracellular organism and the cells that are in the water are amoeba and paramecium. There you um, go. So, yeah, so we see this we see this in water um you know if it's municipal but it's coming from runoff it's sitting in these water towers yeah 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 that's right um, that's right that's and right. then but there's always there tends to be a second component i think as people mentioned that um this is often associated either with trauma or contact lenses we we think it takes a little bit of a, a of a scraping a damage some sort of injury to the cornea to sort of set up the opportunity um and i think bausch and Lomb probably overplayed this this is not a common infection um, this is fairly uncommon. Um, and particularly now in the days of disposable contact lenses, um, I still remember the days of the hard contact lens where you keep them for a month or something and you'd store them in these little, mm -hmm. um, these little containers. And then, you know, what did you do if you, oh, I'm going to sleep over someone's house or, um, you know, where did you get the special solution? So people would, would do these indiscretions um, using tap water, things like that. Um, so now, I guess we should get into, and I think uh, Dixon mentioned this, uh, this can appear as a trophozoite, but also has a cyst stage. So that's a little right. bit of an issue. Um, and how do you treat this? And we had some people jump mm. in on that. Um, so this was treated by the ophthalmologist. So as sort of a peripheral bystander here. Um, and it was combination eye drops. Um, they actually were mentioned there. So the oh. poly hexamethylene biguanide, let's just call that PHMB. Um, and you can actually mix that with the uh, hexaminidine. Um, and so, um, you know, this person was treated for, for many weeks. Um, unfortunately, there had been um, a lot of uh, scarring um, and erosions that had happened. So there was permanent decreased vision in that eye, so. All right. hmm. All right. The hard lenses, uh, you get a, a ring of erosion where the contact lens is making contact with the cornea, but not underneath. With the soft lenses, the amoeba apparently have a greater freedom to move about the entire eye. So that's a very atypical picture for hard lens wearer. It's mostly for soft lens wearers that uh, you'd see that one that was submitted by one of our guesses. Whoever thought that's it was... That's the literature that I'm familiar with. Whoever thought it was a good idea to put a piece of whatever on your eye for for, for eight hours a day, 12 uh, hours I can day. tell you it's... Uh, it's uh, uh, continuous lens. I think it was Revlon that came up with the idea first. Ah, the, they had I the first commercial product. I think cosmetic company. They're quite pop. They're quite popular. I know they yeah, are, but you, no, you but see, I, you, you see, at sporting events, you see them always interrupted. The preseason yeah. basketball games that the player but, loses his contact lens, but, and everybody looks on the floor. Daniel, <laughs> is there any medical condition that you can't wear glasses and you need to wear a contact lens that you're aware of? You know, one of them is that, um, and this is sort of maybe dating our population, but do you remember when people used to have the the radial keratotomy where they would actually have these slits cut into their eyeball to improve their vision? Mm -hmm. And after that was done, you would lose the ability. Um, you know, also if you think about someone who has immune issues, but no, no, I mean, I think pretty wide swath of our population could go ahead and wear contact lenses. Mm. So did they do a corneal transplant for this gentleman? 
um, I don't know sort of follow up down the road, but yeah, that's, so, I mean, that's something to think about, you know, you don't want to say, all right, that's the end of it. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Um, we actually have, um, a lot of approaches. We have lens transplants, corneal transplants, and actually that's a big part of, um, the transplant, um, system is a lot of eye material. Right. Right. All right. It's time for a random number. Oh, we had 13 guesses. And the winner is number 10. That's Erica, who is still hoping Erica. for a book. There you go, Erica. You got there it. You go. Now all um, we have to do is get it to you. <laughs> winner. So Erica, just send me your address and phone, since you're in Canada, to twip at microbe.tv. And sometime in the next few years, I'll get you a book. No. <laughs> 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 I have to you see they're sitting on the on the heater behind me there and it's a matter of getting Dixon and Daniel here them. to That's sign right. them Dixon, Daniel maybe one day I'll just bring them to our, our studio and uh, we'll congregate there and sign them right yeah that'd be a good idea actually that that sounds good <laughs> I, I like I like the idea of that you know, the pre signing they're party. Have, they're going to have antique value or something here, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Uh, let we have a paper to do to to do today, which we haven't done recently. We do. And we Dixon, do. Dixon, you pick this one. Uh, enteric helminth co-infection enhances host susceptibility to neurotropic flaviviruses via a tough cell IL four receptor signaling axis out of Washington University. This is incredible. And a very variety of other places. The senior author is Michael Diamond, who is a flavy virologist. There you go. So what attracted you to this, Dixon? Well, it's a crossover paper between TWIV and TWIP. That's why. And, uh, you know, you, you really see good studies done with dual infections. I've, I've always been turned off by them because... You know, if we don't know what one does, why would we ever know what one and another one does together? And um, I've more or less turned a, a blind eye to them, except in recent times, you've got so much molecular biology at your disposal. You can really dig into the, um, the, the, the synergism or the lack thereof between two rather common uh, parasitic infections. In this case, for the mouse, uh, Helix osmoides uh, polygyrus is a hookworm lookalike. Mm. Okay, it's it's one of those infections that are, are close to hookworm, but not quite hookworm. And they have all of the characteristics of gut dwelling helminths. And, uh, of course, we had a whole show once on tough cells, so I had to go back and review that. Uh, and what happens when a parasite, a, a helminth, uh, in the gut stimulates tough cells, uh, apparently, there's a release of IL-25 followed by a release of IL-13, which leads to the development of type 2 immunity. And that usually increases the goblet cells and the mucus production and the worm is expelled. But in this case, if you infect with West Nile virus on top of this infection, uh, the immune system, I always thought that antibodies were responsible for immunity to West Nile, but apparently there's a lot of cellular immunity involved in this as well as of a type one type. Is that uh, what you think also, Daniel? I, I would agree with that. I mean, that, that's as we think about the classic immunity, right, for viral. Uh, Vincent maybe can chime in. Where's Brienne Barker when you need her? Um, but you <laughs> think of like type one um, being more focused. Because think about the viruses are going to be intracellular. Right. Um, your antibodies are going to be extracellular. Um, I yeah. think I remember an embarrassing time. We tried to tell you antibodies were just going to get into cells and we're, we're confusing MABs with <laughs> I MIBs. I do remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Vincent wouldn't edit it out, but okay. <laughs> um, but no, yeah, no, I think you're right on with that. And, and I, and I was, before you got too far, I was going to say, you know, obviously this, this paper has everything that Dixon loves, right? So it does, it, it does, has, it does. Uh, it has no, I, I'm um, a worm person from one, one of his favorite story. worms, right? Um, you know, the, the polygyrus, which I, I, could, I just pictured when I heard him say that, I was like, yep, that's like a flashback deja vu. Uh, <laughs> it had, it had flavy viruses. It had West Nile virus. Come which, on, which, tough cells, taste. The thing I found good. amazing here is that, <laughs> do you think that tough cells throughout the entire body, and there are lots of them in various other places, communicate via this interleukin system? Um, in, in a sort of an anthropomorphic way, yes, right? I mean, that's that's what, you know, we always we use terms like chemical messengers and um, yeah, 
I mean, so there is some sort of a, um, I, I think communication is the analogy, but yeah, there is some sort of um, connection there, some sort of influence that is occurring. So I read that the urethra has tough cells and when it encounters a toxin, hmm. this is a uh, response to the autonomic nervous system to cause a contraction of the bladder and, and exit the fluid. It, it could create a hyperurination situation due to the tough cells sensing that there's something that the body needs to get rid of mm. right now. Mm. Interesting. So that's, you know, that's not a, a part of this paper, but it certainly says a lot about tough cells, I think. Yeah. So they make the point um, that some co-infection with some enteric helminths can actually benefit respiratory infections. And they hmm. cite a paper, Dixon, co-infection of trichinella and influenza A results in improved clinical outcome. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. But yep. some yep. cases, yep. Uh, helminths promote I wouldn't replication. recommend it as a treatment. <laughs> In yes, some yes, cases, no running out and eating raw I, pork I, I would not your next flu. In uh, contrast, if That's you That's not a great idea, actually. <laughs> <laughs> if you co-infect with helminths, it can promote viral replication. They've, there are studies on noroviruses in mice uh, that have shown that. So uh, depending uh, on where you are looking, you might have a different outcome. Well, and, and so that is uh, one of the reasons they did this study. And, of course, they're interested in tuft cells, uh, which, as Dixon right. said, uh, are, are activated when you get these parasitic infections. And, and what are they doing exactly. to viral infections? And uh, Right. They they use West Nile virus, which apparently uh, replicates in enteric neurons, uh, which is interesting and causes GI tract uh, pathology and neuronal injury. So they put the two together. I think quite an interesting uh, – it's a really well done piece of work. It's beautiful. Exactly. I mean, it, it made it to sell, which is a very difficult journal to get an article published in. So Unless I you're doing that- COVID. <laughs> in that case, anything gets in because all they're interested in is is pr- is a prominence. I'm going to just say I it see. like it is, folks. Oh, brother, <laughs> that's not necessarily the view of the rest of these podcasters, by the way. <laughs> I didn't say it was. I'm just speaking no, as no. always on my own. I don't give a damn if anyone agrees with me or not. <laughs> Do you it's actually fine. have an opinion about this, Vincent? <laughs> yeah, I think the journals are all messed up, and it's a big issue, but we don't have to talk about it here. Shall we go through some of these right. experiments? So be- <laughs> if you'd like. Yeah, actually, I'd like to. Actually, Christina, did you have any comments before we start hitting the figures? Well, <laughs> I, it was it was an amazing paper, really. I don't think I've spent quite as much time on a paper in a long time. I really, really <laughs> dug down. And, you know, if you just look at, at my paper, and my pile of notes. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> I got I got really into it. And I, I have to say, I just, tough cells, I just had completely forgotten about tough cells. So it was a, an entire other exploration. And actually there was a, um, it was a, a commentary in science, maybe in 2019, maybe I can send mm. you a link that really um, describes the tough cells really well. And it mentioned the urethra, um, the urethra, um, I can't think of a word, um, yeah, that EP essentially. Exactly right. You get rid urinate. of your bacteria. <laughs> that's right. That's um, right. To, to be a very non medical and non professional. <laughs> 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 I thought that was really, really fascinating. Um, yeah. Um, so I was going to point out to Vincent if you look at the way Christina highlighted with yellow yeah. on a piece of paper, it doesn't vanish. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. That's a problem with doing it on a computer. But I'm trying to save right. trees, you know. I, don't I want do to. as well, but for this one, it was just too much. And, you know, annotating a PDF is just a pain, really. Yeah, I know. Um, but that's what I, I do. Find, and I complain yeah, so a lot because every some, now and then. <laughs> some PDFs don't hold it. I close that's the true, file yeah. and I open it again. It's all gone, which happened with this week's TWIV. Oh, that's and I do not hesitate to be critical, as you know. Mm. <laughs> anyway, so what right, they so shall we go through the work? Through we, did we lose Dixon? No, Dixon's. He, oh, he left. That's fine. We can start. So, <laughs> first experiment: they feed, they they gavage the mice with the larvae of of this worm, and then put West Nile in the foot pad, and 
West Nile alone, 86% survival. With the worm, 20, 28% survival. So that's a, you don't even need error bars on that. <laughs> That's really clear. Yeah, the, I mean, the Kaplan, the Kaplan Meyer there was really nice. But of course, they do give us statistics, you know, like of you know, star, 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 star. Um, yeah. And so they would like to know why, um, what, why this is. So they start to look at viral titers in different organs. The spleens have the same level, but, uh, it, you know, in the West Nile and, and co-infected, but they find higher viral titers in mes mesenteric lymph nodes, uh, different parts of the colon. And so this is the first uh, in indication that something's going on. The co-infection gives you higher viral titles and titers in certain parts of the mice, in particular uh, gut proximal places. And so that's- Also, I mean, unless I'm reading this wrong, also in neural tissue, is that- Yeah, that's right. I think in the in the brain and in the spinal, spinal cord, they also discovered it was, it was an increase in- in yeah, I guess the most significant yeah. in the spinal yeah. cord, it yeah. looks like. So, yeah. And Quite interestingly, amazing. when you treat the mice with an anti helminthic drug, mm -hmm. you don't get these effects on West Nile, right? Impressive. That's a nice experiment. Yeah. Always, always good to have drugs to do those <laughs> kinds of experiments. Um, th then they look at motility of the GI tract. In, in a singly or co-infected. And I have to note, Dixon, they use the New York 2000 isolate of West Nile virus here. To tip That's of the, the one. To tip That's of the, the hat one. to us. That's right. <laughs> um, <laughs> so they find a lot of changes in the GI tract. Um, you know, sure. dilation, blackening, and then also uh, dysmotility, reduced transit times. And so this uh, co-infection is having a, market effect on that but it happens later right early in the infection not much change then only like six days you get some of mm. these differences um the uh yeah i think it's nice seeing the time course out to 10 days with some of these and yep uh then in this next part they look at enteric neurons uh, they they um, want to know if the co-infection alters the tropism of the virus in the GI tract. So they look for mm -hmm. an viral antigen and uh, neuronal markers to stain the cells. And they find in the co-infections higher levels of viral antigen um, in the ganglia, suggesting mm -hmm. that uh, the co-infection is increasing reproduction in those cells as well. And at the myenteric plexus, yeah. Yep. The what is the meaning of that, though, Vincent? Because West Nile virus is a pretty promiscuous virus with regards to cell type. I mean, so it does, so it, it either it does or doesn't infect that. But uh, so what for a host? Uh, it's still going to get transmitted, don't you think? Um, that is well, to say, what what significance is it for the transmission cycle? I don't That's think. What I meant well, to ask. as you know, it, it depends what kind of host, right? For humans, sure, th it's not transmitted from human to human, so there's no right. Because we birds, go to the hospital before that. That's but right. birds, maybe. Do birds have these kinds of worms? Oh, uh, sure they do. So sure, you bet. It might make a difference. Uh, probably every bird on the planet has a worm, right? Absolutely. <laughs> no, no, you, no, no, listen, I once took a course up at the University of Michigan Biological Station called Post a Host. It was a Helmuth course, but uh, we had access to all kinds of animals up there, and one of them was the crow. And we could not find a worm in a crow. Really? We found it in all kinds of other birds. And you know what crows eat? You see them along the side of the road and they're they eating eat crow. roadkill. They, they eat, eat, <laughs> <laughs> they eat, I they eat that. <laughs> they eat carrion. You think they're eating the carrion, but the guy that gave this course says, you know what they're really doing? They're picking out the contents of the stomach of the killed animal. Yeah. He said they're very fastidious animals. Isn't and they're it, very social. Isn't it interesting that they have no worms, yet they were the first birds to be noticed dying in New York, right? Well, they died from West Nile, that's right. Yeah. That's right. That's exactly right. They're highly susceptible to the virus. So I think in a bird it may help transmission, Dixon. I don't know. It's a good question. Could. Could. 
Yeah, I mean, my, you know, we're, we're sort of speculating, but I guess my thought and sort of thinking about the malaria parallel is if you end up with an encephalitis or some sort of um, CNS invasion, maybe, you know, remember this is arbovirus. So if you can um, take your um, um, sort of source of infection um, and basically get it laying out prone, not moving, right? Because, you know, normally if something, you know, lands on us, we swat it off. But if we're just laying there, and I think this is what happens with malaria, people that are just laying there, high fever, um, they tend to get, and they've done studies, right? Where they've actually, mm. they tend to get bit more because they're not defending right. themselves. Right. Dixon, uh, do, um, way, do mosquitoes have worms? <laughs> <laughs> they're too small to do. In fact, well, you know, they're not too small because black flies have worms. Uh, mosquitoes have worms. Of course they do. They transmit filariasis. So That's maybe not a in laughing the matter, maybe, <laughs> frankly. Maybe in the mosquito, yeah, the, the worm yeah, may do. make a difference for the West Nile infection because it, it could be. It, it does it reproduce be. in the mosquito. That's that's right. So the yeah. uh, it doesn't the worms don't reproduce in the mosquito, but the virus does. Absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Um I was going to go back to that crow story because they found out that when crows become infected with West Nile virus, the first day of their infection, they look normal. The second day, they're a little bit lethargic. The third day, they don't move. Mm. They are sitting ducks for virus for mosquitoes. Dick, so Dick. they're just just like the malaria victim. Yes. They just sit there and they wait, and then they die, of course. But during mm. that interim period, they're viremic like crazy, and that's where the virus really goes to town. Dixon, what does a crow sound like? Oh, oh, oh. That's, a, a, that's he, a U.S. crow. That is not a an Australian <laughs> crow. If you want an Australian crow, I have to work on that one. But they have a very different call. Dixon does a, very a good crow. Call. That's why I ask him that. I, uh, <laughs> uh, the, well, uh, I'm good at some things. The next <laughs> section, they, I find this, this uh, observation really interesting. So in the co-infected mice, the, the villi become altered and it allows bacteria to enter and get into the, and they, they find it in the spleen of the, of the uh, mouse, only in the co-infected animals, which uh, it reminds me, Daniel, of the leaky gut and HIV infection in a way, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you break down the barrier uh, and, uh, you can then find the, the bacteria in the spleen and they give mice uh, fluorescein isothiocyanate and you can see the permeability increase in, mm -hmm. in uh, and co-infected mice. It takes uh, some time, 10 days post-infection, but another interesting observation, I wouldn't have predicted that. You guys impressed yeah, by that? That's interesting. Mm, very. I also thought it was interesting. Very impressed then by the, that. Um, <laughs> the West Nile virus dependent CDC CD8 cells, the response was reduced as a result of yeah. that kind of bacterial invasion in the th in the spleen. Oh. Um, I'm kind of been wondering why that might happen. Um, haven't 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 come up with an answer, so yeah. I'm just throwing that out there. But I did wonder how how that would happen, maybe. So the yeah the. Um right, so there's an alter there's an alteration in uh, CD8 virus specific CD8 responses, right? There's also a, a, a change in the organization of the spleen, right? There's no yes. clear uh, DC and T cell zones anymore, they say. Mm -hmm. And they, as you say, they track it to uh, this, what they call disruption of splenic architecture to uh, the bacteria, right? Mm -hmm. They're doing that. Oh, I remember now they said that they actually couldn't really see any dendritic cells. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so later in infection, the splenic architecture is altered, likely due to bacterial invasion, which impacts key immune cell types, including DCs and virus-specific CD8 cells. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's weird. I don't know why that would be. <clears throat> yeah, I guess they're moving on to sort of make the argument that somehow it involves the STAT six signaling pathway. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. That's and right. a critical in a in a CD eight T cell activation. Right. So STAT six is needed for for Th two responses, right? Which would be a a, yeah, yeah, a yeah. Helminth that's, that's triggered it. response. So, in this paper, by the way, they use all kinds of knockout mice, which is just phenomenal. So now here they use. Stat null mice, right? Mice lacking the stat gene. Mm. 
And in those animals, you don't get the increased lethality and co-infection. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Who would have predicted really interesting. that? Um, and um, less, less virus. So that increase in virus that we talked about in the co-infection, they don't see that in the stat statin all mice. Um, and the abnormalities in the gut, you don't see in statin all oh. mice. So stat six signaling is important. Vincent, I want to interject here that in the real world, there are probably um, at least half of the human beings living on this planet harboring some form of gut-dwelling helminth. Yeah. Uh, they actually talk in the discussion about the geographic overlap between West Nile and helminth. Yep. Because that's, yes, that's yes. what you'd like to know in people. Where is this happening, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. But I'm thinking about things like yellow fever. That's another flavivirus that's very, very lethal. And uh, helminth infections in communities that live near uh, the border between large cities and the uh, wild, uh, wilds of jungles and uh, forests, et cetera, yeah. are, are probably at high risk from this because of this relationship. Yeah, I think it's a good it's point that they actually show that a few other flavies do the same thing, Zika and Poisson virus. So you could probably uh, assume that yellow fever might do the same thing. Yeah, that's a good point. Absolutely. It doesn't have to be the just- The first virus. It doesn't have to <laughs> be it just- it depend on the tropism though of the virus because- Yes, um, yeah, it, so I guess I, it would have sure. to replicate yeah, in the gut, to right? Some enteric, yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't. I don't know. Does yellow fever virus replicate in the gut, Dixon? No idea. I think so. No I idea. Know. I don't think so. Well, I didn't know West Nile virus replicated there. So yeah, I didn't either. It was a surprise to me. <laughs> me neither. Um, yeah, I mean, you you would have known that because you worked on one polio, which does replicate there. Right? Yeah, polio is no problem. Yeah, but um, I wonder if worms make a difference in polio infection of the gut. Good, good question. Very Actually good question. a really good question. Uh, well, we can't really, we, we have a w window of opportunity to do those infections before it's eradicated. Right. <clears throat> Unless you want to work in Pakistan and... Um, no, I, I don't. Not because <laughs> I don't like Pakistan, but it's just Syria. not my home. It's just not my home. You know, they do a nice experiment where they treat mice with uh, antibiotics and they show that you don't get this this increased pathogenicity in the dual infections, right? Because they think mm. it's due to the bacteria, mm. and that shows it, right? And they look yeah. at the CD8. Really nice the way they bring it all together, right? So yeah, you've got very nice. you've got the parasites, you've got the virus, you got the bacteria, the bacteria. you got the immune <laughs> system, you got it all. Come on, complexity. Yeah. It's great. It's great paper. This is why I picked it. No, it's not really why I picked it. But that's <laughs> <laughs> so we we've learned that Stat six is important for this effect, and so now they say absolutely Stat six is activated by IL four. Right. So they then look at IL four signaling on on this effect, and if if you just infect with West Nile, without the worm, and you give IL four, you get a similar increased pathogenicity right. right you know it's just they're very lucky that all this worked out i think <laughs> no, I, I totally agree with you because you you it's rarely this clear cut right yeah it's, it's very rarely you. this clear cut I, I assume there are a lot of experiments that we didn't say <laughs> yeah i suppose so. right. il4 nile 5 no come on try il6 <laughs> so they see uh, <laughs> in these in, in these mice given il4 in west nile they have the same gut changes that they saw before as well. Interesting. You know, transit time. Um, really. Not due to the worm, but due to the virus. Interesting. Yeah, the, just, well, the worm is is um, increasing the IL-4 in the end, right? Right. So you don't need but the worm I, I there. Other worms do. other worms do interrupt uh, gut transit time. Trichinella and, and, has a phase of its life where that there's no gut transit at all. Nothing moves. Yeah. And and here's a cool another cool experiment. So, if they treat stat six null mice with IL four, they don't see the effect. Mm. So it's they going know. through as you would. Really cool. <laughs> they dot all they the know. I's and cross all the T's. Really. Yeah. 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 So this yeah. is a case where a cell paper is really good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> and because Daniel sent it to me, I was able to read it because <laughs> I couldn't download it because it was uh, behind a paywall. Yeah, that's a problem. Paywalls. Paywalls have to go away. 
I would agree. Uh, what else do they do here? Um, they they actually show that the IL four has to signal in the intestine, the intestinal epithelium, right? So the previous experiment was was uh, kind of systemic, but th they show an, it's important in intestinal epithelial cells. And then they show that all of this requires tuft cells, right? Yep. Which uh, are activated by these worms. And and look at this. They have mice that lack tuft cells. They have knockout mice. Ah, they obviously <laughs> went to a different school. And so if you... <laughs> Two, three, four. <laughs> if you do the co-infection in these tough null mice, you don't get the enhanced pathogenesis. You don't get the gut changes. You don't get the CD8 impairment. It's so cool. So you need the tough cells for this enhanced disease. Right. Um, and um, if you take these tough cell minus mice and give them IL-4, then you get the enhanced disease. So it's IL-4 that's, uh, that's doing this. A tough cell IL-4 axis, that's where the title comes from, right? Because yep. um, uh, both are involved. And, and the, other, the last aspect here, tough cells secrete IL-25, which you said in the beginning, and if you give mice recombinant IL-25 um, and infect them with West Nile, Dixon, what do you think happens? Uh, don't put me on the spot like that. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I guess they uh, don't. I guess they get hyperinfected with West Nile yeah, because they that get the uh, switches to an IL-4. They get pathogenic yeah, changes. And sure. um, they further push that another step, which is really cool. Tough cells uh, express the succinate receptor. Oh. Okay, now that's important because a lot of worms secrete succinate. Oh, yeah. Okay. They do. They do. So they're playing right into that pathway. So right they feed the mice succinate in their drinking water, and then they infect them with West Nile. <laughs> and boom, enhanced disease without any worms. So that I didn't know that worms uh, secrete They do. Succinate. They secrete succinate. They do. They do. And so the tough cells respond to that, I guess, and that's what activates them? I guess. I guess. It means that there's something wrong with the gut. Just like in the urethra, there's something wrong with the toxins that are coming out in your urine. I think the tough cells have a remarkable wide range of biological activity. So the, and then, of course, if they take the tough cell minus mice and give them succinate, there's no enhanced disease. So the tough cell is the target because mm -hmm. they have the receptor, right? Right. right. So um, it's just gorgeous. Right. It's just gorgeous. Yeah. yeah. So it what's explains the, um, a lot of. Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say it explains a lot of uh, old work that was done without knowing what a tough cell was, and they were getting all these interesting results that they couldn't interpret because they didn't have access to this uh, rich uh, library of interleukins and cell types. And now you can go back and you can say, oh, I know why that worked, and I know why this didn't work, and I know that's really magical when you can do it like that. Because you should have heard the arguments at these meetings that I went to all the time between helminthologists that were arguing for this mechanism or that mechanism and uh, without a clue as to any of these other things that are going on. So it was frustrating to listen to because we're missing data and we don't have the information and yet you're still opinionated. And I couldn't really understand all of that. Uh, so mm. I, I didn't do much talking to I those people. I think there's a reverse correlation, Dixon. Um, you know, once something is very clear cut, no one has strong opinions. When it's <laughs> controversial, right. yeah, no, you're right. You're right. Know, that's when we're the most, uh, I think, sure. adamant and passionate. No, no and, kidding. Um, so, no, that's, it's nice. Now, I mean, you're going to read this paper. It's really clearly laid out. It's well done. Um, and then, you know, now, now you have the truth instead of, you know, yeah. opinions. Yeah. Follow the science. Follow yeah, the less, science. Less, less opprobrium, more science. Here, here. So they say <laughs> that the geographical overlap between West Nile virus and enteric helminth health infections is mainly Africa and parts of Eastern Europe. Right. But they do note that you know, other flavies are endemic in other areas of the world with a lot of helminths, like South mm -hmm. America, India, Southeast Asia. So Japanese they say, uh, and so they actually say, other whether um, other neurotropic flavy viruses that infect the myenteric plexus have the same outcome should be looked at, right? Right, makes sense. 
Very, very smart. It is, um, and at the end of the day, right, we should just deworm all these people. Yeah, I was there just going to say, you know, yeah. you can't do the control because if everyone has a worm, you don't have a controlled population without worms and you can't see. No, you don't. You don't. You know, there there was a researcher from, he was from London, Christina. Actually, um, I, I sat next to him on a flight back from um, my house from Uganda. Um, and they do <laughs> these interesting projects where what they do is they'll, they're, you know, everyone wants to move the deworming campaigns forward. And so what they'll do is you, you can't move them forward every single village, every single region at the same time. So they, they know what's going on at the start. And then they look at as as they move um, the deworming campaigns into different areas, what is happening? And then they move it into the next town, maybe like we'll say the next year. And then, so they have this sort of, um, you know, trial approach because you don't want to just be, you know, you don't want to be like, okay, you're not getting it. You are getting it. it. What they're doing is they're sort of a natural experiment based upon them rolling forward with a deworming campaign. Hmm. Hey, Christina. The with deworming campaigns is that the worms keep coming back if there's no sanitary control to yeah. prevent them from coming back. And that's the biggest problem, I think. Yeah. Um, they do those worming, deworming programs throughout Africa. The health improves for a couple of months and then it just falls right back down again. And uh, it's frustrating. So, Christina, could yeah, you. I think uh, it's, it's key, right? We went to that talk with the. Oh, yeah. Sorry. No, no. Go ahead. Finish. I was going to say, it's really critical that you have those two components because you can't just keep drugging people forever. Nope, no. um, so the component of also improving the sanitation. Um, yeah, you have to have both. So, Christina, could you imagine Christina, using, you this, uh, in, using this Sorry, paper in uh, any of your classes? Um, I think it might challenge my students maybe <laughs> maybe just a bit too much <laughs> because um, um, I, I, th I think because we don't really do it routinely, we don't really run a journal club mm. and I, I think my students are particularly interested in them. Um, you know, clinical trials or yeah. clinical case studies, but whenever I kind of post basic research, um, they seem to be less keen on engaging <laughs> <laughs> with it. Okay. And I, I mean, it is, it took me, you know, it took me a long time to read that paper and fully understand it and really get all the, all the figures. So I can imagine, you know, if you're a busy doctor and you're doing a, an online course at the same time, um, you know, you might just not have the time. Mm. Um, but I, I was thinking, actually, I was reading it, I might throw it at my um, One Health students. Um, mm. See see how that goes. So, I think um, yeah. you know. the idea. <laughs> I mean, the idea of co-infections is important because yeah. it happens a yeah. lot, especially yeah. true with different, you know, either different viruses or different organisms entirely. And this, uh, it's important to know about that. I think. Right. Mm, absolutely. What I really liked about that paper, what really struck me most of all, it's really. It comes all down to succinate, doesn't it? It's just yes, so indeed. simple. <laughs> yes, yeah, there's all these yeah. really complicated and really well executed experiment, and then it comes yeah, yeah. down to well, yeah. succinate essentially. That's right. <laughs> that was really amazing. You know, it's just it's just so simple and beautiful and elegant, really. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. All right, um, Dixon. Yes, sir. Do, do you have a hero for us? I do. Um, <clears throat> This is a neglected hero because uh, I haven't mentioned him up to this point in this uh, series. So I am gonna make up for that now. His name is Franz von Lichtenberg and um, he taught at Harvard's uh, uh, School of Public Health and also at the medical school. And he was appointed at the Brigham and Women's uh, Hospital. He was a classically trained pathologist from Hungary, born in Hungary. Uh, educated in Berlin prior to the Second World War, he was born of, as they, they, they in his biography, they say he's of minor royalty. <laughs> so if you looked up von Lichtenberg, you would find Hungarian royalty by that name, but they never uh, achieved the crown, so to speak. Nonetheless, um, he, he, he and his family uh, uh, escaped Nazi Germany and came to the United States. And uh, he actually was at Columbia University's uh, Presbyterian Hospital for some portion of his training. And he's um, trained as a, an autopsy 
pathologist. That's that's what he became. But he evolved into a super tropical disease expert in uh, filariasis, schistosomiasis, and leishmaniasis. He conducted experiments in the laboratory. Uh, he was a brilliant mind. He had the, uh, the sense of humor that would remind you of Victor Borga. He was incredibly well-read. He spoke six or seven languages. We're not sure how many. He never used them all at the same time, so we'll never know. Um, <clears throat> he's from a large family, so all of his uh, siblings also spoke multiple languages. And one of the uh, remarkers uh, in his, uh, his memorial service said uh, it was fun to imagine what, was, what language was being spoke at home when they gathered for holidays. Um, Franz was a poet. He was a, 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 an accomplished musician. Uh, he read the classical literature in the original languages of Greek and Latin. And I, I used to hang out with him at uh, tropical medicine meetings because he was a fount of information at every level and fun to be with because he never let you know how smart he was. He always wanted to know what you were doing and what you were thinking about. And he was gracious to a fault. Um, he was the chairman of his bicycle committee at Harvard a Medical School, and he was a very good friend of Elmer Pfefferkorn, who I was, I've also had as a hero on this show. And they, they used to trade stories about their uh, bicycle presidencies as to which one was uh, more prestigious. But unfortunately, uh, neither one of those people are alive today to verify that rumor. Um, he was a, an endearing person at every level. He lived a rich life. He was born in 1920, and he died in uh, 2012. And uh, he was um, he had uh, children. Uh, he had a rich life. He had uh, absolutely grateful students. They said he never uh, avoided teaching them. He never uh, said he was too busy for something. He would always stop, and he was, he was very friendly to everybody. He had no enemies that I knew of ever. So he, he's the, the epitome of a person who uh, you want to emulate and you want to run your life a little bit like his, even though you didn't know what the inner workings were like. You respected his professionalism at every level, and he was always respectful of other people's views, even though he didn't agree with a lot of them. He uh, listened carefully, and then he would ask the fatal question, <laughs> which would destroy the other person if they didn't know what they were talking about. But he was—he did it in such a wonderful style that you didn't even know that's what was going on. But uh, that's how he found out whether or not you actually knew what you were talking about, was to just penetrate a little bit deeper into the subject and keep going until finally you reached the bottom. Um, I can't say enough good about him. I, I just loved uh, knowing him. And... Um, yeah, he's just besides a, a hero, he's uh, one of my good friends that I used to look forward to meeting on an annual basis at these uh, tropical medicine meetings. So I'm glad we have this uh, section set aside. It gives me a chance to wax poetic. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I noticed they flew the flags at half mast when they died. <laughs> when he right. died. In, yeah, no, no, he was highly respected, highly respected. At the hospital. Well, certainly when That's I right. die, they're not going to fly flags at half-mast here, no. No, they're going to raise them. They're going to raise them <laughs> higher. That's right. <laughs> I'm sure that'll happen for me, too. <laughs> well, one more thing is left, and that is to see if Daniel has another case. Oh, I don't think so. Come on. He must be totally out of cases by now, don't you think? Yeah. <laughs> I have a case. I actually have, uh, I have several cases, but let's just do one. Um, I'm hoping this is an easy one. Um, uh, this is actually a case of a woman in her 40s, a uh, patient of mine. Um, and she had been uh, seen initially by her um, by her primary care physician um, after coming back from Puerto Rico. And so the story is this, this woman discovered Puerto Rico in her 30s, um, enjoyed it so much that she actually bought a place in Puerto Rico and often was going back and forth between the United States and Puerto Rico. Um, you know, she got to know, know some people in Puerto Rico. Um, we connected over the fact that, I don't know if I've shared this before, but my mother was a bit of a wild child when she was younger. And so her mother sent her to um, Puerto Rico so the Dominican nuns could whip her into shape. That that failed. Um, 
And the woman explains that she got to know some local people. So now she started going to, um, you know, the local beaches. Uh, you know, it was nice. There were families there. They would bring their dogs. Um, and after um, being um, there in Puerto Rico, she returned here to the United States and she noticed a problem on her foot. Um, she noticed these raised red serpiginous um, lines. Um, she had all these pictures. So it was almost like time lapse. You could see that these red lines were actually slowly moving all over the foot. Um, she brought this to the attention of her primary care doctor who uh, said they were not sure what it was, but ordered some blood work. Um, blood work came back with um, elevated eosinophils, um, she called her friend down in Puerto Rico, her friend in Puerto Rico, who actually, interesting enough, as a clinician down there, said, I know what that is, and this is what you should do. Um, and then I was, I was involved in the case. Is she HIV negative? <laughs> we don't know. We don't know. I did not go there. Uh, no prior medical problems, no toxic habits. Um, I didn't order any additional blood work other than the complete blood count and comprehensive metabolic panels, mm. um, which only show the elevated eosinophils. And did you get a it, picture? Um, so she showed me all these different pictures, and, and that's what I'm describing for you. These the raised red serpiginous lines that appeared to be moving, um, migrating, shall I, shall I say, um, across the surface of, um, it was really like the inside of the foot and then sort of going on top of the foot. Yeah, I'm thinking for our next edition, we could use those pictures. <laughs> <Some> pictures <up. laughs> well, you're right, Daniel. This is really easy, so I don't have to ask any more I'm questions. I'm afraid so. I'm afraid it is. Uh, Everyone's but it's still get. interesting, though, yes? Well, yeah. yeah it's sure. still it's happening. It's interesting either. that it's still happening. Yeah, it's mm. fine. Absolutely. Well, I suppose... I was almost going to give it away completely. No, 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 no. I was going to be quiet. <laughs> 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 Whew, that was do hard. we want it? Does anyone want to know about well water? Anything like that? No. <laughs> no. What kind of dogs were they? <laughs> I have no further questions, doctor. That's okay. right. My case rests. <laughs> Me neither. <Okay. laughs> That's TWIP194. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIP. Send your questions, comments, guesses to TWIP at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, consider supporting us. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute. Daniel Griffins at Columbia University Irving Medical Center, parasiteswithoutborders.com. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, my pleasure. Dixon de Pommiers at trichinella.org, thelivingriver.org. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome, Vincent. Christina Naula, Christina Naula is at the University of Glasgow. Thanks, Christina. Thank you so much for having me back. It was really fun. And now you can go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Daddy. <laughs> it's, I'm not even tired. It's so 1 a.m., right? A Isn't it 1 no, a.m.? No, it's um twenty to midnight. Oh, it's not so bad. Not too Oof. bad. Yeah, no, not, too, not bad. too bad. Not too bad. I'm Vincent Rackenyellow. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIP and Ronald Jenkins for the music. You've been listening to this week in parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another TWIP. Is, is parasitic. parasitic.